Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to present Ryan Scott. Ryan has been working on GHC since 2015, um, where he's worked on type class deriving, template Haskell, pattern match coverage checking, and all sorts of other bits in the type checker. Uh, he works at Galois as a research engineer, uh, where he's been since 2020, working on things like Cryptol, Crux, and Saw. Um, he also maintains a lot of libraries on Hackage and is one of the leading forces of head.hackage, which is part of how we keep GHC up to date with the package ecosystem. So he has a, and he'll be talking about how to get started with GHC, how to use it, how to work on it, um, techniques for making it efficient, all those sorts of things. So uh, if you'd like to join me in giving a big hand to Ryan, that would be excellent. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, David. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is my first time uh, in events adjacent to ZuraHack. And this is uh, also my first in-person talk in like three years. So I'm really excited to get back into the swing of things. Uh, so today, I'm going to be teaching everyone how to get involved in, uh, in the basics of GAC developments. And, and this is really meant to be uh, you know, for your benefit. So if at any point you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. And um, I, I have enough material planned for, for like an hour and 45 minutes. We'll, we'll see if we actually get through all of it. But if, if we get through all the stuff, um, by the end of it, I actually will be able to hopefully walk you through the process of like fixing an actual bug in GHC and going through all the steps to submit a merge request to GitLab and all that good stuff. So um, a little bit about me. I, I learned Haskell over a decade ago now, which is a weird sentence now that I say that out loud, holy cow. Uh, I, I learned it back in 2013 I, as, a, as an undergrad, I think, and um, at, at one point I, I encountered some GHC bugs and I, some of them got fixed after I submitted issues, but some of them didn't get fixed. And after a while I got impatient. I was like, you know, I'm gonna try fixing this myself. How bad can it possibly be? Um, Things were a little bit different back in like 2015 when I made my first GC contribution. Uh, it was not nearly as streamlined as it was today, so uh, there, there were some bumps along the road. But I, I eventually figured it out, and I, um, you know, after fixing my first bug, I, I sort of got the itch to fix more of them, and one thing led to another. And now I'm a GC developer, so um, this is how it starts. Uh, be warned, it, it's it's addictive. Um, so I nowadays I, I deal with stuff mostly in the front end of GHC, and later on in this presentation I will I'll, I'll define what front end means in this context. But I, I deal with things involving deriving, template Haskell, uh, pattern match coverage checker, various things related to type checking and and core and various things of that sort. If at this event or at Zerhack, you want to deal with anything related to these, um, feel free to come and ask me questions. I'd be happy to tell you more details about them. Before I get into like the, the actual technical contents, I, I think it's perhaps worth iterating, why should you contribute to GHC? I mean, hopefully since you're here, you have some interest in it, but um, you know, why, why should you continue keeping up with it even after this event? Um, for me, I, I think one of the coolest things about GEC is that it's really set up so that anyone can actually make meaningful contributions and in a pretty short amount of time. Like we've we set things up so that uh, it's it's pretty friendly to newcomers. Uh, we have lots of forums for asking questions and getting help, and uh, there's a lot of support networks to involved to make sure that you have the support you need to actually see through your your pull requests and and any questions you might have. Um, it'll help you understand the the language and the tooling better, and you know if if you use Haskell at work or recreationally, uh, the skills you learn when developing GEC uh, really have a tendency to pop up in, in interesting and unexpected places. So it definitely pays off to learn it. Um, your contributions will help make the compiler better. And you, know, you, your coworkers, and your friends will all love you if you fix bugs that have been bugging them for a while. And it's really fun. Um, hopefully, I can convey how fun it is as part of this talk and in and, and later presentations. But that is one of the reasons why I've kept at it, um, just because you know I, I don't get paid to develop GAC, but um, it is rewarding to do in my spare time from time to time. Hopefully, you've tried to build GAC, uh, you know, at least attempted it before you come to this event. So the the stuff on this slides will probably be a bit familiar. But just in case, I'll do a, a quick run through of what it's like to actually uh, prepare a checkout of GHC. 
And uh, by the way, I, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that the, the slides that I'm showing here are going to be, I, I think, linked from the website, and I can also post them on Discord and other channels later. So don't worry about taking super detailed notes during this talk. Uh, I'm going to show code and, and links and stuff, but all this information will be in the slides, so if you want to check it out, that is the best place to do it. And in various points in the slides, also have clickable links for things that you can, you can go to. So like, that is a thing you can click on, for instance. GHC supports a lot of different operating systems, and we also have configurations for Nix and Docker. I have the most experience with Linux personally, so uh, some of the instructions here might be a bit Linux-oriented, but uh, other operating systems, the instructions aren't too far from that. So for Linux, uh, the steps you have to take to get everything prepared are uh, installing these dependencies, and in particular, note that you have to install an older version of GHC in order to build GHC. Uh, GHC is a bootstrapping compiler, so most of it is itself written in Haskell. So um, part of the process for building GHC is to sort of go through stages of building uh, intermediate compilers until you get to the final version. So that's why you have to install that. Um, you also need to, of course, check out GHC, and the best way to do that is to check it out from GitLab. And also do make sure to check out the submodules because there are a lot of them and they're quite important to get everything built. I also mentioned that there's a mirror of GHC on GitHub, uh, which, you know, depending on how you like to browse code, might be of interest to you. But personally, I wouldn't recommend checking out GHC from GitHub if you can avoid it, just because there are some extra steps that you have to take to actually um, get all the submodules pointed to the right places. So um, if in doubt, use GitLab. Um, one skill that might be useful as you're developing GHC is you might be trying to fix uh, multiple bugs or develop multiple things simultaneously. So it can be nice to have multiple checkouts of GHC. Um, sort of like the most basic option and the, the easiest to figure out is to just check out uh, multiple copies of GHC with Git. Um, it's crude but effective. Uh, another way that you can do this is there's a a feature of Git called Git Work Trees. Um, I personally haven't used this option much myself, but I know people who, who swear by Work Trees, and there are some aliases that people have developed for more effectively managing Work Trees inside of Git. So uh, if you want to manage everything within a single checkout of, of GHC, then that can be an effective way to do that. So um, you can check out that Stack Overflow link later if you want all the aliases used there. All right, so now we're going to get into the build system aspect of things. Uh, GHC is a bit interesting because it uses its own build system, uh, very much unlike Cabal or Stack, which you use for most Haskell-based projects. Uh, its build system is large and, and sophisticated enough that it has its own name. It's called Hadrian, and it's based on the Shake library, if you've ever happened to use that. So the build system is uh, also built on top of Haskell. And most of the things I'm going to be showing on these slides are taken from the Hadrian README. Um, so if you have questions about like particulars about how Hadrian works, that is a very good reference for answering those questions. All right, how do you actually use Hadrian? Well, most of the time you're going to run these three commands. First, you have to run the boot script and the configure script. And this is mainly because there's a lot of code in, inside of GC that's managed with autoconf, and this is what gets everything set up. So this will detect peculiarities of the particular system that you run on. It'll you know, check to see what size various types have and all that good stuff. Um, one thing is if you are trying to build this on Windows, you might need to pass some uh, different flags to configure to get it set up. In particular, uh, on Windows, there are some dependencies that have to be downloaded externally. And you can pass this enable tarballs auto download flag to configure to uh, make it download all those dependencies for you while configuring. Um, so that's mostly of interest if you're on Windows. But uh, aside from that flag, there's various other configure options for doing things like, you know, if you're trying to uh, do cross compilation or other unusual setups, then you might need to configure it in a particular way. Most of the time, though, you can just get away, get away with running configure, so that's probably fine. The next thing you do is actually run Hadrian itself. And the way you do that is that there is a script under uh, the Hadrian subdirectory called build. And that is your sort of 
one-stop shop for everything Hadrian. There's, there's a lot of different flags you can pass Hadrian. Uh, the, the one I have on the screen here is dash J for running with uh, the maximum amount of parallelism your, your computer supports. You can also pass like dash J4 if you want to limit it to four cores, uh, if you're worried about throttling your machine. Um, so you can start Hadrian with that. Once you've started building, go do something else for a while. Uh, it's it's going to take a while, unfortunately. There's, there's a lot of stuff to build. So um, after you've come back from, from your, you know, brewing coffee or walking in the woods or whatever, eventually you should have a working version of GHC. Um, it's going to be under uh, underscore build slash stage one. And I'll, I'll, I'll describe later why it's in that location in particular. But um, you can test that it works by running GHC with dash dash version. And if it goes well, it should print out something kind of like what I have on the screen. Uh, you'll notice here that the version that it prints out is kind of unusual in that it's not like 9.6. It's, it's 9.7 point the date of the most recent commit. So you can see here that when I built this, uh, it was the 30th of April because of the 0430 at the end. Is it, not, is it the date you configured? Um, Please repeat the question. The question was, is it the date that you configured? And I, I believe the answer is no. I, I think it is set up to display the date of the most recent commit in your tree. Uh, which is helpful because, like, if you're trying to like bisect when a bug was introduced and you and you build things, you can check the version that this prints out to see, like, you know, did this actually come from an old version of GHC? And and you know, it, it won't mislead you just because you built it at a later time. I think technically it's the the commit on at the head of your tree when you configure. Yes. So, yeah, Thank you for clarifying. So if you add commit, if you add commits on the reconfigure, then it won't change the date. Yeah, you mentioned if you add commits after you have built GAC and do not reconfigure, then the date will not change. So an important thing to note there. One possible gotcha um, that you might need to watch out for with, with Hadrian here, um, don't, don't try to run GHCI with Hadrian. Uh, this is a, a common mistake. And the reason you shouldn't do this is because a typical Hadrian build will be a bit more minimal than a, a typical GHC distribution. It's only going to have these binaries included. So if you want to run GHCI, then you should run uh, GHC with the dash dash interactive flag. And, and GHCI itself is an alias for this. Uh, so this is the, the way you should run GHCI. All right, I, uh, I want to talk a bit about um, sort of a little bit of the internals of Hadrian here, because uh, one thing that you'll need to, to do to be able to sort of navigate your way around the things that Hadrian builds is to know a bit about what build stages are. I, I mentioned this before, but GHC is a bootstrapping compiler. Most of the compiler is written in Haskell. So in order to go from a Haskell compiler to another Haskell compiler, uh, you have to build things in, in multiple stages. Um, so, so I have here four different stages starting from stage zero. And, and the idea is that earlier stages in the pipeline will build later stages in the pipeline. So you're going to start with stage zero. And, and stage zero is sort of a, a cheeky way to refer to the, the old version of GC that you downloaded before uh, to get everything started. So this might be something like GC 9.4, for instance. Uh, if you have a stage zero compiler, you're going to use that to build stage one. And stage one is, you can think of it like a really minimal version of GHC that has no extra bells and whistles. It's just going to have uh, the, the core libraries needed to get GHC working uh, in isolation. Once you have stage one, then you're going to use that to build stage two. And stage two is a complete build of GHC with all of the, um, the, all of the extra things you're used to having with a typical distribution. So this would include things like Haddock and Run GHC and other useful scripts of this sort. Most of the time, you'll, you'll actually stop at stage two, but there is actually another stage after this called stage three. And this can be useful if you're dealing with cross compilation. So there's going to be some, uh, some presentations later at the workshop where we'll actually get into stage three, I believe. But if you're just building natively, chances are you're probably not going to need stage three. Um, one, one gotcha of stages that you need to watch out for is when you actually build stages, uh, the place where the binary gets put is perhaps a bit unintuitive. So if you want a stage one binary, 
the place that you look is in uh, build slash stage zero. So I'll, I'll say that again. If you want a stage one binary, you look in build slash stage zero. And the reason that this is the case is because uh, all of the build artifacts of a particular stage get sort of put in the same place. And stage one is sort of a build artifact of stage zero, so that's why that gets put in there. It's, it's kind of weird, but you'll get used to it, I promise. So by a similar token, if you want a stage two or stage three binary, you have to look in the stage one or stage two subdirectories, respectively. Um, are, are, are there any questions about stages before I move on? That's kind of a tricky point. In which stage is base built? Uh, that is mostly going to happen under stage two. Um, you, you're going to sort of use base in earlier stages because there are things from, from base that need to be referenced, but the actual act of like building the version of base that you use in your, your checkout is mostly stage two. Thank you. M my question is a bit more about uh, like, why is it done this way? So couldn't like the install GHC like directly build the full thing on itself? Like, do we need to have this? Uh, why do we need a, uh, uh, to build our core, uh, to build some core libraries and have a version that builds us the, the version in stage two? If, if I really got the, what's happening? So if, let me try to rephrase your question slightly. Are you asking, why don't we just go directly from stage zero to the final version of the compiler? Exactly. Um, I'm going to, try to answer this as accurately as I can, but maybe somebody can correct me if I say something wrong here. I think the idea here is that if you go directly from stage zero to the final results, then the, um, I, I could, aside from like some technical issues that I won't get into here, one of the bigger challenges you have to watch out for is that the performance of the compiler will sort of depend on which version of the stage zero compiler you pick. And, and building this in multiple stages sort of works to counteract that because you, you'll build stage one, which sort of has separate performance characteristics from your stage zero compiler. And then once you build stage two with stage one, then you can make sure that you, you sort of like guarantee that it is performing according to the performance of the head version of GEC rather than the old version that you checked out. Um, I, I don't know if that answer was quite what you're looking for, but th that is my understanding of, of how it works. Um, the question over here. Is there a distinction between basic and complete GHC aside from core libraries and all libraries? As in, does that mean something else than just the libraries? Um, I, I believe so. I, I will admit that I don't use stage one compilers very much because they're a bit trickier to use. Because they don't have everything, you can't typically just run a stage one compiler directly on something and expect it to work most of the time. You have to invoke in the right way. So um, I, in addition to having different libraries, it, it's a matter of like usability and, and how you actually interact with, with it. Uh, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, since GHC is written in Haskell itself, I assume eventually uh, the GHC code base makes use of some new features that are implemented in some version of GHC. So I assume there is a version constraint on the GHC for the stage zero compiler, yes. and if so, what's that version? That is a, a fantastic question. Um, you are correct, and that's um, we we support the two most recent uh, recent versions of GHC that have been released. So at at this moment, we support bootstrapping with 9.4 and 9.6. I, I think it also happens to work with 9.2, but that's not guaranteed to always be the case going forward. Um, so you're also correct in that we do use some recent-ish GHC features uh, inside of the GHC code base. I, I think, for the most part, the, the GHC code base is pretty typical Haskell, but there are some points that make use of type families and other uh, fancy type features like that. So um, that is something to, to watch out for if you're looking at the GHC source code. Thank you. Thank you for all these questions, by the way. Like this, this is a surprisingly tricky aspect of Hadrian, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad there is a lot of discussion about this. So in summary, um, if you want stage X, look for build slash stage X minus one. Uh, oh, do you have a question? Uh, a quick uh, note on why you can't, why we have these stages, aside from the performance considerations. It's also to enable G using GHC as a library, because when you compile 9.6 with 9.4, 
the interface files are written by 9.4, so they can't be read by 9.6 because it's an old interface. Interface file versions change with each each version of GHC. So if you want to be able to, if you want to load GHC into itself, then you you have to compile it with the same like with the same version that you build. Well, that that makes sense. And you build uh, it. Thank you for that follow on. All right, let's move on. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, sort of configuring Hadrian. There's there's a lot of different knobs that you can you can configure with with Hadrian's sort of um, style of output. So the, the most important way to configure it is with Hadrian's build flavors. Um, if you run Hadrian without any additional configuration, then it will pick a default build flavor that strikes a reasonable balance of uh, the time it takes to build GHC and the resulting performance of the compiler in terms of compile times. Uh, but you might want to uh, change it so that it builds more quickly or, or has better compile times. So the quick build flavor is designed to optimize for uh, the time it takes to build GHC, and this is a flavor that I often use when developing things. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is the perf flavor, which takes much longer to build GHC, but the performance of the compiler will be much better. Um, there's, there's also a variety of other different flavors here. There's prof if you want um, to profile the compiler. There's devel1 and devel2, which uh, will enable additional assertions when you run GHC. So if you aren't quite sure if Apache Road is correct and you want GHC to check you, then devel1 and devel2, devel2 in particular, since uh, that is, devel2 refers to stage two, and that's what you're gonna be using most of the time. Um, devel2 can be very useful as an extra sanity check. Uh, so to use that, you can use dash dash flavor equals the, the build flavor that you want. And aside from the build flavors, another way you can configure it is with flavor transformers. Uh, the idea is, oh yeah, transformer, yeah, great, great word. And here it's uh, just applies just as much. It sort of stacks on top of a flavor and uh, lets you tweak things even more. So for instance, let's say you want to build GHC, but you also want to enable the, the dash W error flag to make sure that no warnings creep into your build. You can do that with the W error transformer. So you can say dash dash flavor equals default plus W error. And there are a lot of different transformers. Uh, the debug info one that I show on here is another useful one that produces, uh, I believe, dwarf debugging information, which can be useful if you're on, on Linux. Uh, there's a lot of other transformers, which I won't go into here, but you can check the Hadrian readme if you want a full list of them. Uh, question? Since you can have flavor transformers, why isn't the JavaScript backend a flavor? Why did we have to run a different configuration script for that? Uh, why isn't the JavaScript backend a flavor? It's, I think, a bit more complicated than just like changing things with a flavor. Like, Sylvan can can correct me here, but I believe the JavaScript backend is like a, a full like cross compilation mode of GC and there's there's quite a bit of stuff about the build that has to change to the point where like you sort of have to you know change the way you build GC overall to accommodate it um, so the, is, is that mostly accurate so long yeah. okay it, once again it's complicated <laughs> about spelling uh, we like Canadian English in the GHC source code, and the U in flavor must be provided. If you spell it without a U, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to go well. Uh, question. We have an online question from Bali, which is, how is the relative build time for these flavors compared to Quick? How is the, the relative build times? Uh, Quick is, is definitely going to be the fastest overall, so that can, that can definitely be a useful baseline. I'd, I'd say, like, this all depends on the performance of your machine, obviously, but in my experience, quick can be built in around 10 to 15 minutes, uh, default maybe 20 or so, and then um, like a, a full like binary distribution of GHC maybe half an hour. And, and, and more if you're gonna be like running the test suite and stuff on top of that. So when building with a JS backend, is the stage zero bootstrap compiler also built with a JS backend? Uh, no, and this is because the JavaScript backend is, is cross-compiled. So, so you can use a native stage zero compiler, but ultimately the final build product will be a JavaScript compiler rather than a you know, native one. Thanks. Uh, one, one other 
potential gotcha about Hadrian, besides the spilling of flavor that I want to mention, is that um, one thing I see a lot of newcomers do is, is they will, they'll run Hadrian for the first time and, and be careful to, to specify what flavor they want. Um, and after they built it, they'll rerun Hadrian, but they won't specify the, the flavor flag. And I would discourage you from doing this. And the reason is because Hadrian is a hermetic build system, and it's very careful to sort of you know, check every time you run it to see what particular configuration you're using. So if you run Hadrian a second time without using the same flavor, it will rebuild it according to the new flavor that you sort of implicitly chose when in the second invocation. You implicitly chose the default build flavor by not specifying it. Um, and obviously we want to avoid having to rebuild things if we can, we can get away with it. So one way you can do that is either by making sure that you always pass that build flavor, or another way you can do this, there is a way you can specify user settings. So there's a, there's a file under the Hadrian source tree called usersettings.hs. The way that you can use this is by copying it over to the, the location on the bottom of the screen, Hadrian slash user settings. And then there you can sort of hard code things that you want to be used on every invocation of Hadrian. So I'm actually gonna try and load that real quick. Okay, so user settings is, is a, a Haskell file, and the thing that is probably the most interest here is this user default flavor definition. So you can see here, currently it's default, but you can change that to something like quick if you want to. And yeah, this, this is very helpful if, if you don't want to repeat yourself. There's actually a lot here uh, besides that that I won't have time to go into, but um, the Hadrian README has a full breakdown of all the different things that you configure here. And, Aside from this user settings file, I, I think there's some uh, there's some other ways to configure it if if you want to really like tweak how things are built. So, like you can pass flags to different stages, and there's lots of cool bells and whistles like that. Um, oh, I don't know where that yellow square came from, but um, some other tips that you can you can use to save yourself some build time. This dash dash freeze one flag is really handy. If you've built GHC one time and you're going to rebuild it later, then typically what will happen is you'll change some file and then you have to rebuild stage one with those changes and then you have to rebuild stage two on top of that, which is kind of silly because most of the time you're only going to use the stage two compiler. So freeze one will say, you know, just don't rebuild stage one ever. Just use the old version of stage one for all subsequent rebuilds. Um, and that's really nice because typically it'll take a fraction of the time to just build stage two, then both stage one and stage two. Uh, we have a question over here. I, I would like to say also freezing one can be really useful when debugging things. I don't know if you were planning to talk about that. Sometimes um, you might have a tree, you, you might have made a change to JC, which means you can't, that you can no longer compile JC because you've broken something. But Debugging that is can be horrible because it maybe is going to be like oh some like three thousand long file can't compile anymore, and that's like horrible to debug. So usually what what can be quite good to do, you can't do this if you've think, done something like change in, change the interface file format, but because then freeze one wouldn't really work. But what what you could do is you would build master, then apply your changes, and then do freeze one. And then you can run the test suite, and then you might have like a, a small like ten line test that fails, and you can debug that, which is much better than having to debug like a three thousand long source file of JC. Yeah, that is absolutely true. I, I wasn't going to talk about that too much in this this presentation, but um, in a pinch, stage one can be helpful for diagnosing those kinds of issues. Uh, we have another question over here. Maybe you're going to get to this, but I just how do I get this into my user settings so that says file? Uh, that is a, a good question. Um, so I, I don't know if user settings itself supports this. I, d does anyone recall? Um, there's, there's actually like another configuration file that Hadrian uses, which I, I personally don't use too much, but I, I think you can use that for um, specifying freeze one. I, I'd have to look in the readme, honestly. It's, it's, it's one of those things where I, I, I probably learned this at some point and, and forgot about it. So sorry about that. Um, Thank you. Besides freeze one, another flag, or well, this isn't really a flag so much as another way to use Hadrian. Uh, there's a script called Hadrian slash GHCI. 
the idea is that this is how you load the source code of GHC into GHCI. And I find this super useful because uh, if you want to like really quickly iterate on, on sort of changes that you make to GHC and make sure that they type check, GHCI is a fantastic way to do that. And, and I like to use it whenever possible. Um, one, one warning there is that Hadrian slash GHCI only type checks the code in GHC. It does not actually build it. So you can't actually run GHC from, from GHCI in this way. But even still, I find it as a useful uh, mechanism for just prototyping your changes. And then once you make sure that they, they type check, you can actually do a full build of, of Hadrian after that. So I think that's worth checking out. Another important thing about Hadrian that you can do is, is running the tests from it. Uh, the way that you do that is by running the build script with this test command. That will run the entire test suite, um, which, as I mentioned before, that takes a while, and you probably don't want to do that on your laptop if you can avoid it. Um, so one thing that you can do, which might be helpful, is you can run a subset of the test suite by using this dash dash only flag. So uh, you can give the particular names of the tests that you want to run uh, like that. And, and also, if you submit a merge request to GitLab, then it will run the whole test suite for you. So that can be helpful if you want to save yourself some, some time and cycles. Um, one last thing I want to mention about uh, Hadrian before moving on is that um, you know some people have questions like, how to use Hadrian with HLS? And usually, HLS just works. Um, you, can, you can load. Um, you can load GHC from HLS, and it will sort of know where to look for, for building all the, the necessary files. Um, that being said, I have been, been warned beforehand that it can take a while for HLS to sort of configure and build everything the first time that you load it in. Uh, so uh, Zheng Xiao gave me a helpful tip, and you can run this command before if you want to sort of do all the work that HLS would do beforehand uh, to sort of get everything um, up and running more quickly the next time that you use HLS. Um, uh, this is probably all I'm going to say about HLS in this talk, so uh, Zubin will be saying much oh, more about it later. One quick debugging note, if you run, if you reconfigure and you run into build failures or something, or HLS doesn't work, delete that directory .hie BIOS, that's uh, this one, and re redo things and things should work out, hopefully. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I will say that, yeah, Zubin is, is probably the most knowledgeable person about HLS here. So uh, he's a fantastic resource for figuring out why HLS does or does not work. A uh, question from Gergo Eddy. It seems that a lot of build time goes into Haddock. Is there a flavor transformer specifically to turn off Haddock? Um, I don't know about a flavor transformer, but I, I believe dash dash docs equals none, which actually happens to be on this slide. I think that is uh, another way you can turn off building documentation. Um, so so I, I, I think there are some either build flavors or flavor transformers that don't build Haddock as a side effect. I, I'd have to check. Uh, it's, so that was a bit of a muddled answer, but hopefully that, that gets the point across. All right. Um, I want to go into a bit about how the code in GHC itself is structured. Um, you know, at, after this talk, like we're going to be sort of giving you enough direction to make patches, but in order to do that, you need to know where to look in the source code to make the changes that you want. So I'm going to give a really broad overview of where things are located in the compiler. Uh, probably not enough to like know exactly what file to open, but maybe like the general vicinity of where to look. So here is kind of an abbreviated view of what the source code of GHC looks like in terms of its subdirectories. This is not everything in there, but uh, it, it sort of highlights the most important parts. To look into some other locations for changing things like, uh, for instance, if you need to look at the core libraries that GHC is built on top of, you're going to look in the library subdirectory. That is where things like base and GHC prim and containers and DeepSeq and all these other things live. Most of these are submodules. So, so libraries is kind of just like a, a pointer to those, uh, those libraries. But there are also some things that are checked directly into the source code of GHC, like base. Uh, so if you need changing involving base, that is the place you look. Uh, the RTS subdirectory is where the runtime system lives. Uh, earlier in this presentation, I said that most 
of the GAC source code was written in Haskell. And the reason I say most is because of the RTS. The RTS is mostly written in C. Uh, so if you're doing it the runtime system, uh, hopefully you know C. And, and Ben is going to be talking about the RTS in much more detail later in the workshop. Uh, the util subdirectory is, is kind of like a miscellaneous place where we stash everything that doesn't neatly fit into one of those other categories. So things like Haddock and RunGHC live there. All right, and two other things that I, I want to highlight that you, um, you know, may or may not need. The test suite subdirectory is definitely an important one. That's where all the test cases live, and that's also where the source code for the test suite driver lives. And then there's also this peculiar looking subdirectory called nofib. Uh, nofib is GHC's benchmark suite. So anytime that you submit a, a merge request to GitLab, it's going to run nofib to make sure there are any significant performance regressions. So if you do happen to be making a change that affects the performance characteristics of GHC itself, then nofib might be something that you have to look into. Uh, but other times you can pretend like it's not there. All right. Um, uh, uh, so the, the question is, why is it named nofib, and does it have anything to do with Fibonacci? Um, I, I might, like, slightly butcher this explanation. My understanding of the name nofib is that, you know, when they were trying to come up with a benchmark suite for GHC, they, they wanted something that was fancier than, than Fibonacci, because oftentimes that's what they'll, like, resort to when they want to check how quickly something runs. So... So nofib was sort of like the, the name it came up with to convey that idea. Um, kind of ironically, nofib itself is perhaps, it probably doesn't live up to the original goal it set out to, to solve in that it, some of the programs in there don't quite stress test GHC in the way that you would hope it would. So like nofib has a lot of micro benchmarks, but you know, micro benchmarks only tell you so much. If you want to know how GHC affects like large industrial code bases, then nofib is not a great way to proxy that. So um, there have been some eff efforts to make nofib better in that regard, but it definitely has a long way to go. Uh, the question? Yeah, um, could you maybe tell us why we need a separate build system for Haskell? Maybe. You... Why do we need a separate build system? Uh, it's, it's an unusual project, I, I think, is the best way to answer that question. Um, you know, it, it's not all just Haskell code. So something like Cabal or Stack doesn't easily lend itself towards building everything. Um, you have to build things in multiple stages. You have to have facilities for, like, building binary distributions. And there's, there's, there's enough weird stuff in there that it makes sense to have something custom made. I, I, I think there have been some people who have looked at what it would take to build it with Cabal or Stack, but it's not simple. So... So that's mainly why. Yeah, uh, in addition, uh, additionally, Hadrian is actually more or less just gluing together various Cabal invocations. Not Cabal install, but but rather the library. Uh, it links against the Cabal library, uses Cabal library, and to uh, build the various subcomponents of GHC. Um, and uh, you know, most of the components of GHC are pretty well described by their Cabal file. So and increasingly, we're moving in a direction where GHC is a largely collection of Cabal packages that you might be able to build with Cabal install. But as Ryan says, it is a pretty large undertaking in itself, and you know it's a slow process. Thank you. Yep. I, I want to take a, a brief uh, sojourn into the, the actual code that you might see in GHC, just because um, there are some perhaps unusual conventions used inside of GHC, and, and you should be aware of them before you, you step into this. So uh, one thing that I, I think is definitely worth emphasizing is the conventions used for capitalizing uh, things in, inside of the Haskell code. So here is a piece of Haskell code that I, I took directly from GHC source code. Don't bother trying to understand what this does. In fact, really don't look at this code. This uses head. Ugh, that's gross. Uh, the point I want to emphasize here is the capitalization used here. So the thing on the top, TC lookup rec cell parent, that uses camel case, whereas the thing on the bottom, any con, that uses snake case, and, and this is intentional. Uh, the reason they do this is because they generally have a convention that um, things that you export and are part of the public API should be in camel case, whereas things that are uh, not exported or local identifiers, those are, are used uh, in snake case. So that, that's kind of a quick way you can tell them apart. Um, I, I won't claim that everything follows this convention perfectly, but uh, where possible, it, it's, it's worth trying to stick to that convention. 
another thing that I, I think is definitely worth pointing out is indentation. So here are two pieces of code. These were taken from the same file in GHC. The thing on the right uses semicolons. Um, if, if you've developed Haskell for a while, you're probably not used to seeing this because it's not used very often. Uh, nevertheless, semicolons are used quite a bit uh, in, in GHC, perhaps more than any other Haskell project. And um, our, I think we have a style guide, but we, we don't really enforce the use of like white spaces indentation versus semicolons, just because like people are very opinionated about this and we can never get everyone to agree. So I would advise, you know, if you're dealing with code that uses white space, stick to using white space. And if you're dealing with code that uses semicolons, stick to using semicolons. Um, and if you're developing new code, use whichever one you like better. One other thing that's definitely worth highlighting here is documentation. Um, there's a lot more to GHC than just the code. And, and there are also various other things that it checks to make sure that like, you know, there's no dangling submodules or things like that. Um, it, it's pretty lightweight as far as linters go. It, it doesn't have too many strong opinions about like, you know, how many characters are in a column or something like that. But um, it, it, it checks enough, I'd say. Um, so going back to the topic of notes, um, these, these two pieces of code here are involving the pretty printer and it's, nuanced enough that they decided that they need to have kind of a long form prose comment describing how the pretty printer works. But what's interesting is that these two functions are from different files inside of GHC. So, um, you know, you could copy paste the same comment in both of these locations, but that would be a bit unfortunate because you'd have some duplication. So they had, what they did was they factored out into a separate note. Uh, so we have this, this kind of mega comment elsewhere uh, with notes pretty printing via iface syntax as the title. And then below it, it describes in full detail how that aspect of GHC works in a form that you can read without necessarily having to read all the code accompanying it. And, and this is great both as a sort of organizational technique and as a way to make sure that like you don't have large chunks of comments breaking up the code. So it's a bit more readable that way. So. I would really strongly recommend that if you write a patch and it sort of takes you more than like a paragraph to describe what you're doing, it's probably worth leaving a note so that you uh, leave enough breadcrumbs for future readers to figure out what was going on at the time. Do you have a question in the back? Do we have some kind of special uh, HADA comment for notes so we can navigate them easily when the HADA build is, when the GHC is built? Or if we do not, how is it possible to do it? So I've seen that in the comments, we have things like C note and um, note, I don't know, lookup note, and it's not really friendly to look it up. And sometimes you gotta go and search it. Can we build some kind of special had a comment for it so it's easier? Um, perhaps. I, I know that Haddock has some support for like if you um, you have an export list, you you can definitely name like chunks of documentation in the export list and Haddock will render those. What I'm less sure on is if Haddock can support things that are referenced in different files. And then I think that is a large reason why notes existed because oftentimes you'll have some feature of GHC that is implemented across a large variety of different files and you need some central location to have the documentation for. So that is to a large extent why that convention is in play. I, uh, I think there are some external tools for like conveniently linking to notes from different files. Um, I, I haven't used them myself, but um, I, something like GEC tags might be able to handle this. I, I'd have to check it out to see if that's actually the case. All right, so when we last lo left off, uh, we had just gotten done talking about uh, Hadrian as well as the sort of organization of the code inside of GHC. So I'm, I'm gonna do sort of a little bit of a deeper dive into um, how the compiler is, is set up in terms of going from a source Haskell file to an actual uh, executable or piece of object code. Um, this is not going to be like as comprehensive as some of the other presentations later, but hopefully it's enough to give you a, a sample of, of the things to come here. So as always, questions are encouraged. Let's start with the uh, front end of the compiler. So, so the compiler is split into roughly two parts, the front end and the back end. And I'd say the, the part where you delineate the front end from the back end is when you get to uh, the, 
the core intermediate language, roughly. And I'll talk a bit about core later. But the front end of the compiler is, is all about sort of the surface syntax of Haskell. And, and the different phases of the front end do various things to the source AST of Haskell. So, so in this diagram, we start from, uh, from a Haskell file. And the first thing that happens is you have to parse it. And that's what the parser does. Um, the parser kind of split things up into uh, lexical tokens and, and make sure you don't have any obvious syntax errors or silly mistakes of that sort. Um, we, we don't have any presenters at this workshop who are going to talk about the parser in, uh, in a, a lot of detail, but we do have some people here who are knowledgeable about the parser, such as uh, Vlad in the back. So, uh, yeah, if you have parser questions, uh, he can almost certainly answer them. Um, so that's all I'll say about the parser for now. Uh, the next step is a bit more interesting, the renamer. Uh, the idea behind the renamer in a nutshell is that you want to give all of the identifiers in your program unique names. And, and this is really helpful from a, a compilation perspective because when you're doing later passes, uh, it's a lot easier when everything has unique names. So like if you have two local functions named go, for instance, you can properly tell them apart. And, or if you have two type variables named A but are bound in different locations, you can tell those apart. Uh, Sam is going to be talking about the renamer uh, in much more detail later in the workshop. Um, so after the renamer comes what is arguably the most uh, heavy-duty part of the front end, which is the type checker. And as the name suggests, the type checker will make sure that uh, your program is type correct. Uh, Simon is going to be talking about the, the type checker later, but there's a lot that goes into it, and everything from uh, unification to um, uh, to making sure that like you have everything you need to compile down to core later. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, and I am probably not going to be able to do it justice here. So um, I think I'll I'll leave Simon to that task. And then once you have a type checked AST you actually turn it into core. And that is the job of the desugarer. So the idea behind the name desugarer is that you're going from the, the source syntax of Haskell, which is quite large and has a lot of language features, down into GHC core, which is much smaller in comparison and, and has uh, a lot fewer going on in there. Um, so, so that is the front end. And uh, if you want to make changes to the front end, there are a handful of data types that you should probably be familiar with. Um, these are the AST data types, and you can find these under language slash Haskell slash syntax. Um, here are a couple of those AST data types. So we have HSExper and HSType. A lot of these AST data types have the HS prefix in front of them. So um, these aren't the complete definitions here, but you can see the data constructors used for variables, for applications, for lambdas, and, and similarly on the type side. Um, one other thing that I'll mention about these AST data types uh, are these interesting looking fields that have names that start with X. And the idea is that X is short for extension points. Uh, we have a, a convention in use in GHC where we share the same data type across multiple phases of the compiler. And some phases require information that other phases don't. or, or some phases require entirely different information. So these extension points are where you stash that phase-specific information. And uh, there's, there's a paper about this called Trees That Grow. If, and we have a note accompanying that in the GC source code if you want to learn more about Trees That Grow. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And again, I don't know if I'll have enough time to really talk about Trees That Grow in a lot of depth. But um, that's a good starting point if you want to learn more about front-end development. So the other part of the compiler is the back-end. And, and there's a lot uh, more going on in this slide. So we started off from the desugarer, and that takes us to GHC core. Um, you'll notice that one of the, the phases here has a loop there, uh, core simplification. And the reason there's a loop is because um, most of the optimization that happens inside of GHC happens over GHC core. Um, and the reason that this is the case is because GEC core is a typed intermediate language. So anytime you perform uh, a pass of simplification, you can check to see if that optimization was correct and didn't introduce any bugs. Well, you can check 
to some degree that it didn't introduce any bugs by checking to see if the resulting core is type correct. So there's a lot of different types of simplification that occur. Uh, Sebastian is going to be talking more about the simplifier part of how core is simplified later in the workshop. Um, so after GHC core comes another intermediate language called STG. Um, STG kind of looks like Haskell, but it's, it's sort of more operational than Haskell. It has more low-level details of, of things that you care about that are closer to the runtime. Um, by the way, if you're curious, STG is, is, uh, is an abbreviation for spineless tagless G machine. Uh, I don't know why it's named spineless tagless G machine, but, but that's, that's a mouthful, so we usually abbreviate it to STG. Uh, uh, so the question was, you know, SCG is, is uh, short for spineless tagless G machine. What does the G stand for? And that stands for graph. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a the, that part of the runtime is, is based on, on graphs. Um, I'll be honest, I don't understand SCG that well, so I'm, I'm not qualified to say more than that. Um, Vlad chimed in, so maybe he has some opinions about this. But um, yeah, STG is, is I, I'd say, sort of an intermediate step towards getting towards machine code. Uh, that, that's, um, there's, there's a lot going to be said about the runtime system that I won't get into, but I think Ben might talk about it in, in his presentation. Right. Cool. Ryan? Um, question over here? Uh, if I may, I can provide some elaboration to why STG is named STG. So in the past, right, so in the past, in like the 80s or something, most, um, when, when lazy evaluation was new, most Operational models of lazy evaluation involved graph reduction, but I think over that time, the two paradigms called by, uh, in, of call by value languages and call by need languages, they basically consolidated their efforts and came out at what's nowadays basically an STG language. And uh, you can use STG both to model strict evaluation as well as lazy evaluation. And uh, namely by having memoization in the backend at runtime and, and have special stack frames for it. And this spy, uh, spineless tagless qualifier was just to denote that, well, previously graph reduction would mean that you would have to find the next radix and which would need, mean you would have to walk down the spine of the graph in some, some sense. And as well, tagless would mean that every closure or every value would announce whether it's a lambda, whether it's a data constructor and so on, which is solved in STG by means of a pointer indirection, which makes it morally tagless. So th th these qualifiers don't make much sense today. Think of STG as an untyped lambda calculus with some special forms so that you can see the evaluation order much more cle clearly. Thank you so much. That was a super helpful answer. A uh, question from Eduardo Online. Is SCGifying where we unfunctionify the code to match the hardware, or is this done via GHC core already? Um, to some degree, it unfunctionifies things. I, I would say that happens more so on the, the, the CMM level, which I'll, I'll talk about next. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that's all I'm qualified to say. Duncan? Uh, I was just going to add a, a follow-up to the uh, previous explanation and say that it's no longer tagless as well. <laughs> it was originally tagless, uh, but since the mid-2000s, um, it's been tagged because it turned out to be faster. So, but, but it's okay because the T still works. So <laughs> it's still STG. All right. Spineless tagged G machine. Okay. Well, that kind of works. Um, the, I guess the, the important thing to take away here is that this code is old. Right, it's decades old. Um, so there are some historical anachronisms in there. Um, so so I, I mentioned in my earlier answer that the, the next uh, phase after STG is uh, Cogen, and that's where you go from STG to yet another intermediate language called CMM, which you can read as C minus minus. And, and as the name C minus minus suggests, it's like C, uh, but it's even more low level. It, it is uh, probably as close to bare metal as you're going to get in the compiler pipeline. And then um, once you're at CMM, then it, it's a uh, short stop away from getting actual machine code that you can run. Um, so here's where some of the, like, the this parts of the diagram really branches off at, at this point. So there are a lot of different um, things that you can make as far as object code goes. Um, 
often you're going to be just producing straight up machine code and like uh, x86 or ARM or something like that that you can run natively. Um, besides that, there's also a WebAssembly backend, uh, which is much newer than the, the native backend. And Cheng Xiao is going to be talking more about the, the WASM backend later in the presentation. Um, you, you might have noticed if you're paying attention, there is there's actually a part that I skipped, uh, which is the JavaScript backend. Um, the JavaScript backend is a, a bit unusual in that it doesn't come from CMM, but rather it comes from SCG. And Sylvan is going to be talking more about the JavaScript backend later. Um, so there's, there's also a bunch of other different targets that I didn't have room on this slide to present, like uh, the LLVM backend, for instance. So there's, there's actually a lot more in this, this one ellipsis than, than you might think. Um, so so that, is, that is the backend in a nutshell. And um, you might wonder, like, where do you get started with developing the backend? Well, I would say the one thing you should probably make sure that you understand, even if at a cursory level, is how core works. Because a lot of the optimization, a lot of the code supporting the backend involves core in some way or another. So core is located in compiler slash GHC slash core. And it's actually small enough you can fit it on one slide. Um, the cool thing about core is that you can boil all of Haskell with all of its many language features and other bells and whistles down into a data type with just 10 data constructors, which is, which is pretty nifty. Um, and most of these things have sort of kind of counterparts to things you'd find in the, sor the, uh, the source language of Haskell, um, maybe with the exception of tick. Tick is kind of a, an exception because it's used for a special profiling mode. Uh, and that's, that's mainly why that exists. But almost everything else here has a, a counterpart to something in, in Haskell. Um, I guess another thing that's worth pointing out here is this coercion thing. Um, you typically don't think about coercions. Uh, well, you, you might think of coercions in like the uh, data.coerce sense, but, but coercions are, are actually more of like a lower level thing. We actually have some like kind of proof object inside of core that, that casts from one type to another. So. In core, there are no new types. There are no type families, and, and GDTs don't look quite like they do uh, in the source language. And the reason is because they are all compiled down to coercions. So that is the reason for that last data constructor there. Um, there's, there's more that could be said about core, but I think I will leave it at that. So if you're interested in backend development, um, definitely make sure you're, you're familiar with core at the very least. Uh, question. Why is there both you know, this coercion data constructor as well as a cast where coercion appears separately. And, and the reason is that coercions are kind of like first class things that can appear in, in other places besides casts. So you might see a coercion um, in, in another type of expression. For instance, there are coercion variables. So it's actually possible to have a coercion appear underneath a var in some places. Um, casts are, are like a sort of like Casts are like the, the main use case for coercion because coercion exists to cast from one type to another. So um, a subset of coercions will appear underneath uh, this cast data constructor, but not all of them. So, so one is kind of like a specialized use of coercions. We've got a fair few um, intermediate um, representations here. I was wondering which of these are specific to GHC and which of them are um, I don't know, standardized or um, used in other projects as well. Okay. Um, I would say that GC core is probably the thing that's most specialized to GHC. Um, I mean, as the name suggests, like it, it is deliberately trying to represent um, Haskell plus GHC's language features. Um, STG and CMM, I guess, are to some degree specialized to GHC because that was what I think originally motivated them. If, if not GHC, then um, you know, earlier versions of Haskell, but they are to some extent reusable. I, you know, STG is meant to be like a uh, generic intermediate language for lazy functional languages. And I think there have been some people who have experimented with using STG as a uh, you know, runtime backend for languages besides Haskell and GHC. So it, it can be used for that. And then CMM is also similar in that regard. And that's, um, it's, it's useful as sort of like a close to bare metal language for for various languages. Um, another question? This is from Proby. When I run dash d dump simple, I often see jump in the generated core. Is that just syntactic sugar provided for my benefit? Um, it is, I'd say, more than just syntactic sugar. Uh, the jump keyword in particular 
um, is involved. It's something involving GHC's join points, which are a particular type of optimization used in core. Um, I, I, I'm not a leading authority on join points, but it, it's sort of related to how uh, the control flow works and, and making sure that you don't do as much allocation as you otherwise would. Uh, I wonder how self-contained are these uh, phases. So, I mean, if I want to develop my own language, but I want to use, say, the STG as the backend of my compiler, is it possible to use it or is it deeply uh, integrated into GHC? Uh, it should be possible. I admittedly have never done this myself. I, I think, Vlad, you've actually tried using yeah, SDG yeah. in a, a different setting besides GC. Maybe you're better equipped to answer this question than I am. Uh, so you have to separate the actual code that is in GHC implementing those languages, STG and CMM, and the ideas and the papers behind them. You could totally reuse the concept and like have your own implementation of STG, just follow the paper and use that in your language. CMM as well, there's the, the Hoople paper, use that, it's, those are very good. As far as the code itself is concerned, it is possible, but there is some friction. For example, STG, as it is implemented in GHC, it reuses core types. It mostly ignores them, so it only looks at the Repre runtime representation of the core type. So you have, for example, in Haskell, int and int hash. Those are represented differently. So that's important to STG. But you have int and bool. Both of those are just pointers. This is not important to STG. But it like doesn't separate those cleanly. It just reuses the core types. So if you, in your language, have some advanced type system, you might have to just use a uh, unit for everything. Like when you generate STG, even if you have ints, bolts, and other data types, you just unsafe curse them into unit. It's, it's not pretty. So you can make it work, but uh, it's not designed for that. Thank you for that answer, Vlad. That was fantastic. Uh, really brief, I might add, uh, few of us are interested in making these parts more reusable and less sort of overfit for GHC as it exists today. So um, if you have projects of the short you'd like to do, it'd be really great to make those projects known, get some sort of big list of them. Um, that, that can help us prioritize which are sort of mere apples in our mind versus actual things that real people would like to do and um, therefore be more strategic. Thanks. Thank you, John. And I guess I'll mention, John is one of the leading forces behind making GHC more modular in general. So if that is a thing that interests you, uh, seek John out. All right. Uh, so it, it's taken us a while, but we haven't actually written a patch yet. Um, perhaps it's time we do so. So I am, I'm going to walk you through the process of uh, picking an issue uh, and I guess maybe figure out how to fix it depending on what you're interested in. And then uh, I, I've actually pre-selected a, a relatively simple GEC bug before coming to this event that we can actually sit down and, and fix together to give you an idea of what this process is like. So to start with, um, there's a lot of GEC issues out there and um, it can be somewhat intimidating to sift through them all and figure out which things are, are good for someone who is new to GAC development to fix. So one measure we've taken to, to make this a bit easier is there are labels on GitLab that uh, we have uh, people who triage issues and, and give labels to everything. One of the labels is the newcomer label. So you can uh, type in newcomer into the GitLab issue tracker and it will come with all the things that um, someone who is, you know, with, with good taste in GC development has looked at and said, you know, this is something that someone who is new to GC development could reasonably fix uh, in some amount of time. Um, so that is a good way to do it. Alternatively, if you, you know, have particular interests and aren't sure if, you know, the issues under the newcomer label are something you're interested in, feel free to ask one of us. Uh, depending on what part of the compiler you're interested in, we can point you in the direction of something that uh, would be nice to do and, and could be done in a short amount of time. All right, what is it actually like to fix a bug? Um, every bug is a bit different, so uh, I, I can't give advice that will apply 100% of the time, but generally speaking, you're gonna follow these series of steps. So the first thing is you have to pick the bug and then 
please announce once you've picked your bug uh, that you're actually working on it. And, and this is a courtesy to other GAC developers. So you'd, be, you'd be surprised how often somebody you know, fixes a bug in private, and then right as they're about to submit a patch, they, someone else swoops in and submits a different patch for the same bug. So announcing it can make sure that you don't accidentally waste someone else's time uh, who wants to fix the bug at the same time. So please do that. Uh, the best way to announce it is to go to the issue on GitLab and either leave a comment saying, I want to work on this, or if you have the permissions, actually use GitLab's assign feature to assign yourself to it. And if you give up, then, other than say you're giving up. Oh yes, that, that is another important point. It's, um, you know, ideally we'd help you see it through to the end, but if it proves too challenging or, you know, you become interested in something else, then it, it's definitely worth saying, I'm no longer working on this as a courtesy to other developers. Um, so the next step is to add a test case. And I, I'm very deliberately putting this as the next step before fix the bug. And, and the reason is because, you know, one, it's test-driven development is a good practice. And two, you'd be surprised how often you build a head version of GHC, try to run the test, only discover that the bug has actually been fixed in the meantime. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an actively developed compiler, so sometimes people fix things by accident without intending it to. So adding a test case is a good smoke test to make sure, you know, you didn't accidentally, like, uh, pick something that was fixed ahead of time. Um, so if you're lucky, the bug will be fixed and you can do something else. But if you're unlucky, um, you know, you'll run the test and discover, I can reproduce the issue on a head version of GAC. So once you've done that, you have everything you need to make sure that when you do fix the bug, which is the next step, uh, you can run the test later and make sure that your, your fix is actually correct. Um, so step three is fix the bug. You know, I, that's like, draw the rest of the owl, right? There, there's a lot that goes into fixing the bug, and that will depend on what the bug is. But um, it will involve writing code of some kind. That's, that's really all there is to say about that. Um, step four, make sure the test case passes. Um, I, I'll sort of refresh you on how to run the, the test suite of Hadrian to, to make sure that happens. But essentially, you pass dash dash only equals the name of your test case, and that will run just that test. Once you're confident that your patch is correct and all of the tests that you wrote have passed, then you can write a commit message. And very importantly, make sure to reference the issue number in your commit message, uh, just as good Git hygiene. And also, if you reference the issue number, then that will actually appear on GitLab. So there's a, a thing that links it back to the, the commit that you wrote. Um, if you want, you can even write fixes issue number, um, although, it, it, you know, depending on what type of patch you write, it may or may not actually fix all of the bug. Sometimes you, you submit patches that fix half of a bug, so you have to use your best judgment there. The next step is to submit a GitLab merge request. Uh, if, if you use GitHub or GitLab, it should be pretty familiar on how to do this. Um, if, if you don't have the right uh, permissions to do so, or if you don't have a GitLab account, uh, seek Brian out and he can have, get you set up with that. And then, after you submit a merge request, uh, you're probably gonna have somebody chime in with review comments at some point. So there will be some back and forth and making sure that uh, all of your code is uh, up to the standards that we have in GHC. Um, but hopefully that won't be too bad. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that process later. But once you've incorporated all the feedback and everything looks good, someone will go through the process of landing it. And that is, that, basically the last step in fixing the bug. Um, there might be some additional steps that GC maintainers take later, like backporting your fix to older versions of GHC and stuff like that, but you probably won't have to worry about that yourself. That's something that uh, GC's maintainers do. That's uh, just a process thing to be aware of. Um, so speaking of the review process, um, a, a pretty common question is, you know, after I submit a merge request, who do I need to seek approval from? Um, I would say seek approval from at least one person in the, the following two categories. So various parts of GHC have code owners, uh, which are people who are knowledgeable in that part of the compiler and have contributed enough that they, they frequently review patches to those parts of the compiler. Uh, oh, it is? Okay, well, um, it, it can be a good sort of first 
thing to look at if, if you have no idea who you should ask as a, a reviewer. The, the code owner's file inside of GUC at one point was up to date with who was the most knowledgeable about each part. Um, if that fails, which it sounds like it might, then um, there are various people who maintain GHC either you know, full-time or part-time, and, and they are very often chime in with uh, helpful suggestions. So anyone at the bottom of the slide is a, 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 an authority on GHC, basically. So if you see Ben's turtle, uh, you know, that's a good sign. You've, you've got someone who is expert on uh, various parts of the compiler chiming in. So um, yeah, Ben's turtle or, or Sam's uh, uh, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I, like I mentioned before, I've pre-selected a bug, and I'm gonna steal this one, so sorry. Um, we're gonna try fixing a bug. Uh, so the part of the compiler that this deals with is template Haskell. So if, if you're not familiar with template Haskell, I apologize, this will, will require some knowledge of that. I'll, I'll try to explain as I go. But um, one thing that I noticed recently is that in, in template Haskell, uh, it, it's sort of Haskell's metaprogramming facility, um, you, can, you can splice in uh, some things that are not legal Haskell code. And this is an example of something that is not legal. So this is a data type. Um, but what's interesting is that it is a, a it's not a gadget, but it has a kind signature. So when you splice it in, it looks like this. And that is definitely not legal Haskell code. And, and luckily, template Haskell will catch this and throw an error message if you try to do that. So that's good. Um, but what's not good is that it doesn't apply this check everywhere. So in particular, if you change data D to new type D, um, it will not catch this. Um, you can splice it in. It will just happily accept it without complaints. Um, so that's unfortunate, and we'd like to be able to fix that. So. The reason that this happens after some, some digging is that the, the code for actually taking a template Haskell representation of a data type and converting it to a Haskell AST, um, this has some validity checks here. Um, so you, you don't need to understand this code line by line, but basically what this is checking for is that um, uh, if something is not a GADT declaration but does have a kind signature, then it will throw an error here. And one thing to note about error messages in GHC is that every error message has an associated uh, code, and there's a data constructor that represents that code inside the GHC source code. So this is this is kind of a, a new thing inside of GHC. There's been an effort to like make error messages more structured. Um, so we have a structured thing for each type of, of error that can come from GHC. Um, so so this part of the code has these validity checks. But the code that converts new types from template Haskell into a Haskell AST does not have these validity checks. It has mostly the same code otherwise, it's just missing that one extra piece. So the, the task here then basically is to make sure that all of those validity checks are used in all the same places. And, and one other thing that I'll note here is that in addition to ordinary data types, there's also data families. And Data families are also missing this check, so these are also accepted by a mistake. Um, okay, so let's let's go through the bug fixing checklist. So the first thing that we need to do is assign ourselves to it. So I actually did this ahead of time, but just if you want to do this yourself, you can either go to the assignee part and pick yourself. There's also a shorthand for doing this in GitLab where you can run slash assign and then your username. And I've already done this, so it won't let me auto-complete that. Most people can register accounts on GitLab, but not everyone has permissions to assign themselves. So if you don't have permission to do this, then you can also just leave a comment saying, I would like to work on this or something. Um, that works just as well. And if, and if a GC maintainer sees a comment like this, they'll often just assign you afterwards. So either way, uh, you'll get assigned. Luckily, I have prepared a patch ahead of time, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and apply that. You need to take five more minutes. Okay. You can do it ten yeah, minutes. it's, well, the, the fix is actually not that interesting. It more or less amounts to copy-pasting this code into 
into here. I mean, you can go further than that and like factor the, the checks out into its own function, but that, that's more or less all that is involved. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, all right. Yeah, so, so here I've, I factored out these checks into its own convert data definition cons function. That's more or less all that's going on here. So the next step is we need to write a commit message. And actually, I think I, I wrote a commit message ahead of time. Yes. GC speed running. Oh yes, I need to actually add all this stuff. All right, and very importantly, make sure to mention the issue number in this commit message, which I, I do here. Uh, one, one little minor convention here is that whenever you have a, a branch for a new bug fix or feature, we typically use work in progress slash T followed by the issue number. Um, I, I think the linter actually checks to see if work in progress is part of the, the branch name. So do make sure to use that. Once you- that, that is true. You can also uh, fork the GAC repo in GitLab and, and submit a merge request that way if, if you prefer doing it. So let's go ahead and push this. Yes, I, I agree. There are too many conventions. We should fix that. Okay, so I've, I've gone and pushed this. So hopefully that should show up here. Uh, yes, you can actually see that it referenced the commit that I just made. So now I'm going to go into merge requests and it recognize my, my commits. Let's create a merge request from that. Um, so you'll, you'll notice here that there's a checklist of things that you should make sure you do before submitting a merge request. So um, make sure that everything is buildable. I've done that. Uh, make sure that um, all of the commit messages say what they do and I've done that. I've left comments, I have added a test case, um, and also another part is to make sure that you replace uh, this template with a description motivating your change. So in this case, that's the commit message. So I can do that. Oh, sorry. I, I thought you were just indicating minutes left. So what's the question? Um, so this is from Bali, who asks if there is a preference for code duplication versus factoring out things. What are the general rules? Uh, I would say the general rule is try not to repeat yourself if possible, but there are some places where repeating yourself is, is less painful than not repeating yourself. So sometimes it comes down to personal judgment. Like, you know, Configuration-related files in particular, sometimes you kind of have to specify where things are located in multiple locations. And sometimes that can be painful than like finding some grand way to like only refer to one thing in one location. So that's my general rule. All right, so let's, now that we've done that, let's go ahead and, yeah, so there's an assignees box. Um, you actually don't have to fill in assignees most of the time just because uh, GEC maintainers will automatically get assigned uh, whenever you submit a, a merge request. So I would say only use this if there's like a particular person you really want to see your merge request. Um, I, I think I'm one of the people who look at template Haskell merge requests. So I could assign myself as an assignee, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so let's create that. I guess another thing I'll point out here is the CI, whenever you push something, uh, you can see the CI running here. And uh, don't expect this to be done quickly because it has to build GHC in several different configurations. But uh, this goes through several stages where like the first stage will do like linting and other basics like that. And then subsequent parts of CI will actually build GHC, make sure everything compiles and runs the test suite. Um, so I think that's everything I wanted to go through as far as fixing a bug goes. Uh, do you have any questions about the particulars of that? Uh, the question was, does any contributor have uh, permissions to run the CI pipeline? And the answer is yes. And, and this is one of the reasons why we sort of like go through a little more, little more overhead in requiring um, you know, people to seek out Brian to create accounts just because we want to 
save on CI resources, among other things. There's also a lot of spammers. I'm trying to make a point of making sure people get uh, registered right now. Definitely. The last thing I, I want to mention before I, I break is that um, there are other ways to contribute besides fixing bugs, which I didn't really mention too much before. But if, if fixing bugs isn't your thing, that's fine. There are other ways you can help out. Um, one thing that is really valuable is people looking at documentation and making improvements to it. And this can range from things like, you know, there's a, a Haddock comment on a function in base that isn't as clear as it could be, or there is a note inside of GAC that's a little vague on something. So uh, figuring out what the documentation should say and making a patch to fix the, the documentation is, is really appreciated. So that's one way you can help out. And uh, another thing that's helpful is a lot of times people submit bugs where it's not clear how to reproduce the bug without building some large project. So it's really helpful to have people figure out how to minimize the bugs into self-contained files where you can just run GHC on it and reproduce the bug. So that's, that's another really helpful kind of contribution. Uh, question? Um, is there perhaps a minifier for Haskell exactly for this, this purpose, right? Where sort of it fuzzes a little right or minifies the, uh, the code base and lines it, or do you have to do it by hand? You have to do it by hand. I, I think there have been some efforts to make a, a minifier, but I, I wouldn't say that they're like ready for prime time yet. Um, I would say, Sebastian, I think you've looked at this a little bit, but um, for, for time reasons, I won't go into it more than that. Um, lastly, I'll say if, you, uh, if you're not sure about how to fix a bug or if you have any other questions, we have a lot of different resources. At the workshop, we have Discord, uh, which is where a lot of us will be hanging out. But after the event, we also hang out on a variety of different platforms. Uh, you can ask questions on GitLab if you like, or if you have something where you think having a more synchronous conversation will help. We, uh, a lot of us GAC developers hang out on uh, the GAC channel on IRC. There's also a, a bridge to that channel via the Matrix platform, if you prefer using Matrix. And we also have a mailing list where you can ask questions in more of a traditional email kind of format. All right, that is everything that I have scheduled to talk about today. All right, well, thanks everyone and happy hacking.